Well, last Friday, hundreds of thousands of computers around the world were hit by a cyber attack from a computer virus called, appropriately, WannaCry. The biggest cyber attack of its kind in history. Computer security programmers were able to stop the attack. The man who stopped the WannaCry cyber attack was just arrested for creating a virus of his own. This video would not be possible without Andy Greenberg, the writer for Wired. A link to his article will be in the description. Around 7am on a calm Wednesday in August 2017, Marcus Hutchins stepped out of the Airbnb mansion in Las Vegas, where he had been partying for the last 10 days. Marcus, a 6'4", lanky 23-year-old hacker, emerged to grab his Big Mac and fries order from an Uber Eats delivery driver. However, Standing barefoot in the mansion's driveway, he noticed a black SUV parked on the street, which appeared suspiciously like an FBI stakeout. He stared at the vehicle, his mind still foggy from a lack of sleep, and the effects of legalised marijuana he had been smoking all night in Nevada. For a brief second, he wondered if this was the moment he had been dreading, but just as quickly, he dismissed the thought believing that the FBI wouldn't be so open in their surveillance. With his feet starting to burn on the hot driveway, he grabbed the McDonald's bag and returned to the mansion, crossing the courtyard to reach the pool house, where he had been staying. With the SUV no longer haunting his thoughts, he rolled another joint with the last of his weed, smoked it while munching his burger, and packed his bags for his first class flight back to the UK. Hutchins was recovering from an eventful and exhausting week at DEF CON, one of the world's largest hacker conventions, where he had been hailed as a hero. A few months prior, he had saved the internet from the world's worst cyber attack at the time, WannaCry. WannaCry started to explode across the world, destroying information of hundreds of thousands of computer systems. Hutchins single-handedly neutralized it by triggering the kill switch embedded in its code. This incredible act of white hat hacking made him a legend among the DEF CON community, resulting in free drinks, VIP party invitations, dinners with journalists, and selfie requests from admirers. Hutchins, the geek working from his bedroom in rural England, had become the saviour of the internet and the digital realm. Still riding the wave of worship, Hutchins wasn't in the right state of mind to worry about the FBI. Then he spotted them again. The black SUV parked near the mansion a few hours later. He took an Uber to the airport. His thoughts were still clouded by cannabis. At the airport, Transportation Security Administration agents, TSA agents, surprised him by allowing him to keep his three laptops in his backpack as he went through security. They seemed determined not to delay him. Hutchins made his way to an airport lounge, sipping on a Coke and settling into an armchair. With hours to spare before his flight to the UK, he posted on Twitter, expressing his excitement about returning to his malware analysis work. Everything seemed normal until three men, one of them a burly redhead with a goatee and the other two in customs and border protection uniforms approached him. They asked if he was Marcus Hutchins and when he confirmed his identity, they asked him to come with them, leading him through a private stairwell. Then they handcuffed him. In a state of shock, feeling like he was watching himself from afar, Hutchins asked what was happening. We'll get to that, the man in charge said. Hutchins tried to mentally review every possible illegal act he might have committed that would cause customs interest. Could it be related to the unspeakable crime from years ago? Was it a minor issue, like having forgotten marijuana in his bag, causing the agents to overreact? The agents escorted him through a security area filled with monitors and settled him in an interrogation room, leaving him alone. The redhead man returned with a petite blonde woman, both flashing FBI badges. Initially, they struck a friendly tone, asking about his education and his work at Crypto's Logic, the security firm he had worked for. For a brief period, Hutchins allowed himself to think they were only interested in his insights into WannaCry. Then, 11 minutes into the interview, they bought up a program called Kronos. Kronos, Hutchins repeated, I've heard that name before. And slowly, the realization set in that he might not be going home as he had thought.
14 years earlier, well before Marcus Hutchins became a hero or a villain figure. His parents, Janet and Desmond, established their residence in a stone house on a cattle farm in the remote region of Devon, just a short drive from England's west coast. Janet, born in Scotland, worked as a nurse, while Desmond, who hailed from Jamaica and had initially been a firefighter, later became a social worker. He first met Janet in a nightclub in 1986. They had their home to raise their two sons, nine-year-old Marcus and his seven-year-old brother. Initially, the farm provided the ideal setting that they were seeking. The two boys spent their days playing with the cows, observing farmhands as they attended to the cattle and their newborn calves. They constructed tree houses and makeshift catapults from spare wood and enjoyed tractor rides with the farmer who rented them the house. Hutchins, a bright and content child, was open to making friends. According to his father, Desmond, he described him as having a very strong sense of right and wrong. Even when he had an accident and broke his wrist while playing, he didn't shed a single tear, his father recalls. However, when the farmer had to put down a lame and brain damaged calf that Hutchins had grown attached to, he cried uncontrollably. Hutchins didn't always blend in with the other children in Devon. He stood taller than his peers and he didn't share the typical English passion for soccer. Instead, he developed a preference for surfing in the cold waters just a few miles from his home. At his school, he was one of the few mixed race students. But what truly set Hutchins apart from his surroundings was his extraordinary fascination for computers. From the age of six, he watched his mother use Windows 95 on the family's computer. His habit of dismantling the family's PC and loading it with unusual programs often irritated his father. He soon regarded programming as a gateway to build whatever he wanted, finding it far more thrilling than the wooden forts and catapults he constructed with his brother. There was no limits, he says. In his computer class, where his peers were still learning the basics of word processors, Hutchins was bored. The school's computers prevented him from installing the games he desired, such as Counter-Strike and Call of Duty, and restricted his internet access. However, Hutchins discovered a workaround. He found a feature within Microsoft Word that allowed him to write scripts in a language called Visual Basic, enabling him to run any code he pleased, and even install unimproved software. He used this trick to install a proxy server, rerouting his web traffic through a different server, effectively evading the school's web filtering and monitoring efforts. On his 13th birthday, after years of fighting for time on the family's aging computer, Hutchins' parents agreed to get him his own computer. In his mother's words, the computer became his complete and utter love, overshadowing almost everything else in his life. Hutchins still made time for surfing, and he had taken up surf lifesaving, a form of competitive lifeguarding in which he excelled, earning several medals at the national level. However, when not in the water, he would be on his computer either playing video games or honing his programming skills for hours on end. Janet Hutchins grew increasingly concerned about her son's digital fascination, especially fearing how the darker aspects of the web, which she half-jokingly referred to as the internet boogeyman, might influence him. She attempted to install parental controls on Marcus's computer, but he quickly employed a simple technique to gain privileges upon booting up the PC disabling the controls. She also tried to restrict his internet access through their home router. But Hutchins found a hardware reset on the router that allowed him to revert it to factory settings, then configure the router to boot her offline instead. After that, we had a long chat, Janet said. She even threatened to disconnect their home's internet entirely. Instead, they reached a compromise. We agreed that if he reinstalled my internet access, I would monitor him in other ways, she recalls. However, in reality, monitoring Marcus was virtually impossible because he was way more clever than any of us were ever going to be, she admitted. While many mothers' fear of the internet boogeyman may seem exaggerated, Janet's concerns were not. Within a year of obtaining his own computer, Hutchins began exploring a basic hacking forum 
dedicated to causing havoc on the popular incident messaging platform, MSN. There, he encountered a community of like-minded young hackers who proudly displayed their creations. One member boasted about developing an MSN worm that masked itself as a JPEG image. When someone opened it, the malware would discreetly and instantly transmit itself to all their MSN contacts, some of whom would fall for the ruse and open the image, setting off a round of messages, creating an infinite loop. Hutchins didn't fully comprehend the purpose of the worm, whether it was designed for cybercrime or simply a spamming prank. Nevertheless, he was deeply impressed. I was like, wow, look what programming can do, he remarked. I want to be able to do this kind of stuff. Around the time he turned 14, Hutchins contributed his own creation to the form, a straightforward password stealer. When installed on a computer, it could extract the passwords of the victim's web accounts, which were saved by Internet Explorer for autofill convenience. Although the passwords were encrypted, Hutchins had also figured out the location where the browser stored the decryption key. Hutchins' initial piece of malware earned approval from the forum's members. As Hutchins' hacking journey began to unfold, his academic performance was declining. After returning from the beach in the evening, he would head straight to his room, eat in front of his computer and pretend to sleep. Once his parents ensured the lights were turned off and retired for the night, he would return to his keyboard. Unknown to us, he'd be up programming into the wee small hours, Janet says. When she woke him the next morning, he looked ghastly because he'd only been in bed for half an hour. At one point, his concerned mother even took him to the doctor, where he was diagnosed as a sleep-deprived teenager. One day at school, around the age of 15, Hutchins discovered he had been locked out of his network account. A few hours later, he was summoned to a meeting with a school administrator. The staff accused him of carrying out a cyber attack on the school's network, causing severe damage to one server that it needed to be replaced. Hutchins denied any involvement and requested to see evidence. According to him, the administrators refused to share it. Nevertheless, by that time, he had gained notoriety among the school's IT staff for consistently getting around the security measures. As a consequence, Hutchins received a two-week suspension and a permanent ban from using school computers. The response from that point forward was to spend as little time as possible at school. He transitioned to a nocturnal schedule, sleeping well into the school day and often skipping class altogether. His parents were deeply frustrated, but apart from the moments when he was trapped in his mother's car, receiving a ride to school or going surfing, he mostly managed to evade their punishments. They couldn't physically drag me to school, Hutchins remarked. I'm a big guy. By 2009, Hutchins' family had moved from the farm into a house that occupied the former post office of a small village with just one pub. Marcus took a room at the top of the stairs. He rarely emerged from his room occasionally stepping out to microwave a frozen pizza or prepare more instant coffee for his late night programming marathons. For the most part, he kept his door locked, diving deeper into a secret life from which his parents were excluded. Around the same time, the MSN forum that Hutchins had regularly been visiting had shut down, leading him to transition to another online community known as Hacker Forums. The members of the new community were slightly more advanced in their hacking skills. It was an assembly of young hackers who tried to impress each other with acts of exploitation that often didn't have any moral constraints. Gaining respect within the hacker forums community required possessing a botnet, which can consist of hundreds to potentially millions of computers being infected with malware that followed a hacker's commands. These botnets could be used to unleash junk traffic at adversaries overwhelming their web servers and causing them to go offline in what is commonly known as a distributed denial of service attack, a DDoS attack. At this point, there was no overlap between Hutchinson's life in the English village and his secret existence in the cyberpunk world. There were no real world reminders to discourage him from adopting the moral principles of the shadowy work he was entering. 
As a result, even at the young age of 15, Hutchin soon began boasting on the forum about managing his own botnet, which consisted of over 8,000 computers. He had mostly compromised these systems by uploading deceptive files to BitTorrent. Hutchins took his activities to a new level by starting his own business. He began renting servers and offered web hosting services to the members of Hacker Forums for a monthly fee. The business, named Ghost Hosting, openly promoted itself as a hosting service where all illegal sites were permitted. In one post, he even suggested that customers could use his service to host phishing pages meant to mimic login screens and steal victims' passwords. When a customer inquired if hosting Wares was acceptable, which is the software from the black market, Hutchins promptly replied, yeah, any site but child porn. In his teenage mindset, Hutchins still perceived his actions as being different from genuine cybercrime. Hosting untrustworthy servers, stealing a few Facebook passwords, and exploiting compromised computers to engage in DDoS attacks against other hackers hardly seemed like the serious offences that would attract the attention of law enforcement. After all, he wasn't committing bank fraud or stealing money from innocent individuals. Or at least, that's what he told himself. He claimed that the red line for him was financial fraud. And he considered it out of line with his self-defined and ever-shifting moral code. Within a year, Hutchins grew tired of his botnets and hosting servers as they involved dealing with a lot of whiny customers. So he abandoned both and focused instead on something he found more intriguing, perfecting his own malware. He began dissecting rootkits created by other hackers, programs that are designed to alter the computer's operating system to render themselves completely undetectable. He analyzed their functionalities and learned to conceal his code within other computer processes to make his files invisible in the machine's file directory. When Hutchins shared some simple code to showcase his advanced skills, another member of Hacker Forums was so impressed that he asked Hutchins to develop part of a program that would test whether specific antivirus engines could detect a hacker's malware, a sort of anti-antivirus tool. Hutchins received $200 in the form of an early digital currency called Liberty Reserve for the task. This same client offered him $800 for a form grabber. It is a rootkit capable of covertly harvesting passwords and other data entered into web forms and transmitting them to the hacker. Hutchins gladly accepted the offer. Hutchins started gaining a reputation as a skilled malware ghostwriter. Then, when he turned 16, he was approached by a more serious client who would be known to Marcus by the name Vinny. Vinny presented Hutchins with a proposal. He wanted a all-round and well-maintained rootkit that he could sell on hacker marketplaces, far more professional than hacker forums, such as exploit.in and dark0de. Instead of paying for the code up front, Vinny promised to share half the profits from each sale with Hutchins. They decided to name the product the UPAS kit, after the Javanese UPAS tree traditionally used in Southeast Asia to make poison darts and arrows from its toxic sap. Vinny appeared distinct from the amateurs that Hutchins had encountered elsewhere in the hacker underground. He was far more professional and discreet, never revealing any personal details about himself, even as they conversed more frequently. Both Hutchins and Vinny took care not to log their conversations. Hutchins took precautions to mask his online activities routing his internet connections through multiple proxy servers and hacked computers in Eastern Europe to confuse any potential investigators. However, he wasn't as diligent in guarding his personal information from Vinny. In one conversation, Hutchins complained to his business partner that the quality cannabis was scarce in his village, located deep in rural England. Vinny responded by offering to send some through a new site known as Silk Road. In 2011, began the early days of Silk Road, a dark web marketplace known for selling illegal drugs. Hutchins himself thought it had been a hoax. Bullshit, he wrote to Vinny, expressing his disbelief. Prove it. Vinny asked for Hutchins' address and date of birth. He wanted to send Hutchins a birthday gift. Hutchins, in a moment that he would later regret, 
provided both pieces of information. On his 17th birthday, a package arrived at his parents' home. Inside were cannabis, hallucinogenic mushrooms, and ecstasy, sent as a gift from his new associate. Hutchins successfully completed the development of the U-Pass kit after nearly nine months of dedicated work. In the summer of 2012, the root kit was made available for purchase. Hutchins didn't inquire about the identity of the buyers. He was primarily delighted to have transitioned from a show-off on hacker forums to a professional programmer. His work was sought after and appreciated. The monetary rewards were also quite appealing, as Vinny began paying Hutchins substantial commissions for each sale of the UPass kit always in Bitcoin. Hutchins experienced his first substantial disposable income. He upgraded his computer, purchased an Xbox, and invested in a new sound system for his room. Additionally, he began to explore Bitcoin day trading. By this point, he had abandoned school together and left surf life saving behind after his coach retired. He told his parents that he was engaged in freelancing programming projects, which seemed to satisfy them. With the success of the UPass kit, Finney suggested that it was time to develop UPass kit 2.0. He wanted additional features from the sequel, including a keylogger capable of recording every keystroke on victims and the ability to capture their entire screen. Most significantly, he wanted a function that could insert counterfeit text entry fields and other content into the pages victims were viewing, a feature known as a web injection. Vinny also made it clear that he possessed knowledge of Hutchins' identity and address. In the event that their business relationship soured, he hinted that he might share the information with the FBI. Particularly, the request of the web injection alarmed Hutchins. In his view, web injects had a specific purpose, facilitating bank fraud. Many banks required a second layer of authentication for transfers often sending a code via text message to the user's phone, which they must input on a web page to confirm their identity. WebInjects allow hackers to bypass this security measure by manipulation. A hacker would initiate a bank transfer from the victim's account. And when the bank prompted the hacker for a confirmation code, the hacker would insert a fake message on the victim's screen, asking them to reconfirm their identity with a text message code. When the victim entered the code from their phone, the hacker would transmit it to the bank, confirming the transfer from the victim's account. Over the years, Hutchins had taken many small steps into the realm of online crime, sometimes blurring the lines he was crossing. However, during the conversation with Vinny, he realised that he was being asked to do something fundamentally wrong aiding thieves in stealing from innocent victims, and inviting law enforcement's attention in a way he never had before. Until then, Hutchins had chosen to believe that his creations might only be used to compromise people's Facebook accounts or build cryptocurrency mining botnets on their computers. I could never be certain what was happening with my code, he admitted. But now it was obvious. This would be used to steal money from people this would be used to wipe out people's savings. He refused Vinny's demands, writing, I'm not working on a banking trojan. Vinny persisted and threatened that he knew Hutchins' identity and address. If their business partnership ended, he might share the information with the FBI. Hutchins recalls feeling both scared and angry with himself from revealing his personal information to a partner who was turning out to be a ruthless criminal but he remained firm and threatened to walk away. Vinny, who understood that he required Hutchins coding experience, managed to reach an agreement with him. Hutchins would work on the updated UPass kit without the web injections. While developing the next generation root kit in the ensuing months, Hutchins began attending a local community college. He developed a bond with one of his computer science professors and found himself wanting to earn a degree. Yet, the weight of his studies, coupled with the responsibility of building and maintaining Vinny's malware, proved challenging. His business partner was growing increasingly impatient for the new root kit to be completed, and he consistently demanded updates. To cope with the pressure, Hutchins resorted to Silk Road once again, 
buying amphetamines on the dark web to replace his late night coffee consumption. In June 2014, the rootkit was complete and Vinny began selling their work on cybercriminal marketplaces like exploit.in and dark ODE. Later, he also listed it on Alpha Bay, a site on the dark web. Following disputes with unhappy customers, Vinny decided to rebrand and abandon the UPass label. He coined a new name, one of the most infamous banking trojans in the history of cybercrime. Vinny named his malware after a cruel giant in Greek mythology, the father of Zeus and other vengeful gods. He called it Kronos. At the age of 19, Hutchins and his family relocated once more to a four-story, 18th century building in Ilfracoon, a Victorian seaside resort town in another part of Devon. Hutchins took up residence in the basement, having his own bathroom and access to a kitchen, formerly used by the house's servants. This setup allowed him to isolate himself further from his family and the outside world. When Kronos was launched on exploit.in, it achieved only moderate success. The primarily Russian hacker community on the site was skeptical of Vinny, who didn't speak their language, and set a high price of $7,000 for the Trojan. Furthermore, like any new software, Kronos had its share of bugs that required fixing. Customers demanded continuous updates on new features, placing pressure on Hutchins. He faced a year of relentless coding. He was now dealing with tight deadlines and angry customers, demanding quick responses. To cope with these challenges, while attempting to complete his final year of college, Hutchins significantly increased his consumption of amphetamines. He took enough to reach what he describes as a euphoric state. In this condition, he claimed he could still find enjoyment in programming work and suppress his growing anxiety. He recalls, Every time I heard a siren, I thought it was coming for me. He would overcome these anxieties with more stimulants. He would stay awake for days, alternating between studying and coding, followed by episodes of anxiety and depression before lengthy 24-hour sleep sessions. The constant changes between extreme highs and severe lows negatively affected Hutchins' judgment. This was shown in his interactions with an online friend he referred to as Randy. Hutchins encountered Randy on a hacker forum called Trojan Forge, following the release of Kronos. Randy initially asked Hutchins to create a banking malware, but when Hutchins declined, Randy requested assistance with legitimate enterprise and educational applications he was developing as business. Hutchins saw this as a mean to legitimize his illegal earnings through legal income and agreed to help. Randy proved to be a generous sponsor. When Hutchins mentioned that he didn't have access to a Mac OS device for Apple app development, Randy asked for his address, which Hutchins provided, and sent him a new iMac as a gift. Later, Randy asked about Hutchins' possession of a PlayStation console, hoping to play games online together. When Hutchins said he didn't have one, Randy shipped him a new PS4 as well. Unlike Vinny, Randy was open about his personal life. As Hutchins and Randy grew closer, they started having phone calls and even video chats, rather than relying on faceless instant messaging. Randy impressed Hutchins by describing his generosity and how he used his profits to support charitable initiatives, such as free coding education programs for children. Hutchins sensed that much of these profits stemmed from cybercrime but began viewing Randy as a Robin Hood-like figure. Randy disclosed that he was based in Los Angeles, a location Hutchins had long dreamed of living. At times, they discussed the potential of living together, operating a startup from a beachside resident in Southern Carolina. Randy trusted Hutchins enough to involve him in his Bitcoin day trading techniques. Hutchins developed custom code programs that included short selling to protect his Bitcoin investments against price movements. Randy asked Hutchins to manage his funds using the same strategy. One morning during the summer of 2015, following an amphetamine fueled binge, Hutchins discovered that a power outage had occurred overnight. His computers had shut down as the price of Bitcoin experienced a substantial drop. 
resulting in the loss of nearly $5,000 from Randy's savings. Still, in a drug-induced state, Hutchins panicked. He immediately contacted Randy online and confessed to losing the money. To compensate for the loss, he offered Randy a free copy of Kronos. Knowing that Randy had previously shown interest in bank fraud malware, Hutchins thought this might settle their financial discrepancy. Randy understood the situation and agreed. This marked the first instance in which Hutchins disclosed his involvement with Kronos to anyone. However, upon awakening with a clearer mind the following day, he realised he had made a terrible mistake. As he sat in his bedroom, he considered all the personal information Randy had casually shared with him over the past months. It dawned on him that he told his most dangerous secret to someone with poor operational security. Hutchins concluded that sooner or later, Randy would be apprehended by law enforcement and was likely to cooperate with authorities. Hutchins had already resigned himself to the idea that he would eventually be arrested for his cyber crimes. Now, he saw the Fed's path leading directly to his doorstep. Shit, Hutchins thought to himself. This is how it ends. Upon graduating from college in the spring of 2015, Hutchins tries to break free from his amphetamine addiction and opted for a cold turkey approach. In the initial stages of withdrawal, he found himself sinking into a familiar depressive low, which he had experienced repeatedly in the past. However, a few days into his withdrawal, while watching the British teen drama Waterloo alone in his room, he began to experience an overwhelming sensation he described as impending doom. Although he rationally understood that he wasn't in any physical danger, a sense of imminent death overwhelmed him. Hutchins chose not to reveal this with anyone and to face the withdrawal alone. Enduring what he called as an extended panic attack over several days. When Vinnie inquired about his delayed work on Kronos, Hutchins claimed that he was still preoccupied with school rather than admitting to the crippling anxiety he was facing. As the symptoms continued and his productivity continued to drain in the weeks that followed, he realised that Vinny was less of a concern. Vinny eventually stopped bothering him and the Bitcoin payments for Kronos commissions stopped. The partnership that had trapped Hutchins in the darkest phase of his cybercriminal life was over. Over the next few months, Hutchins spent most of the time in his room, focusing on his recovery. He played video games and indulged in binge watching Breaking Bad. His outside adventures were infrequent, primarily involving swimming in the ocean or joining groups of storm chasers gathering on the cliffs near Ilfracoon to witness 50 and 60 foot waves crashing into the rocks. Hutchins found solace in the wave's ability to make him feel small contemplating how the raw power could potentially end his life in an instant. It took several months for Hutchins' sense of impending doom to go away, eventually replaced by anxiety. As he stabilised, he began to re-engage with the world of hacking. However, instead of participating in the cybercriminal underworld, he revived a blog he had initiated in 2013. During the period between leaving secondary school and starting college, the blog name Malware Tech also served as Hutchins' alias. He published numerous posts detailing the complexity of malware. His blog began attracting visitors from both black hat and white hat hacking backgrounds. Hutchins viewed it as a neutral ground where both sides of the cybersecurity landscape could find value. At one point, he conducted an in-depth analysis of web injections, which had previously caused him considerable anxiety as a part of Kronos. In other posts, he pointed out vulnerabilities in competitors' malware that made it possible for other hackers to commandeer their victims' computers. His blog gathered an audience of over 10,000 regular readers, and none of them seemed to be aware that malware tech's insights were informed by his own history of writing malware. During his rehabilitation year following Kronos, Hutchins began reverse engineering some of the largest botnets in the world, such as Kellios and Nikurus. He soon realised he could take it a step further 
by infiltrating these groups of compromised machines to analyze them from within. Kalios, for instance, used a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, allowing one victim computer to send commands to another instead of relying on a central server. This made it harder to dismantle the botnet. Hutchins created a program that mimicked the Kalios malware and enabled him to speak its language, allowing him to monitor the botnet's operations. Using all of this information, Hutchins constructed a Kalios botnet tracker, which mapped out the hundreds of thousands of infected computers around the world on a public website. Not long after, an entrepreneur named Salim Nainau, CEO of a small Los Angeles-based cybersecurity firm called Crypto's Logic, contacted Malware Tech. Nainau was interested in employing an anonymous blogger to assist in developing a botnet tracking service that would alert victims if their IP addresses were found among a collection of compromised machines, similar to Kelios. Crypto's Logic had already tasked one of its employees with infiltrating Kelios, but the employee claimed that reverse engineering the code was far too time consuming. Hutchinson unraveled one of the most baffling botnets on the internet. Nina offered Hutchins $10,000 to create the Kelios tracker for Crypto's Logic. Within a few weeks of securing his initial job, Hutchins built a tracker for another, even larger botnet. Crypto's Logic extended a job offer to Hutchins, complete with a six figure annual salary. When Hutchins saw the financial terms, he couldn't believe it. He thought, What, you're going to send me this much money every month? This salary exceeded any earnings he had previously obtained as a cybercriminal malware developer. Hutchins had come to a realization about the cybersecurity industry. For a skilled hacker in a Western country, cybercrime simply doesn't pay. During his initial months at Crypto's Logic, Hutchins managed to infiltrate one massive botnet after another. The malware networks collectively spanned over millions of computers. Even when these new colleagues at Cryptos believed that a particular botnet was impenetrable, Hutchins would consistently surprise them by providing fresh code samples of the botnet, often secured from readers of his blogs or underground contacts. He repeatedly deconstructed the malware, all from the confines of his bedroom, facilitating the company's access to a new array of zombie machines. His efforts involved tracking the malware's transition and alerting the victims of the hackers. Salim Nainau, the CEO of Crypto's Logic, was thoroughly impressed with Hutchins' work. He stated that when it came to botnet research, Hutchins was arguably one of the best globally. Within a few months, with Hutchins' assistance, Crypto's Logic successfully tracked every major botnet in the world taking their work to an entirely new level. Hutchins continued documenting his work on his malware tech blog and Twitter account, gradually earning a reputation as a highly skilled malware expert. Despite his growing recognition, his true identity remained a closely guarded secret. Most of his tens of thousands of followers only knew him as the user behind the Twitter avatar featuring a Persian cat donning sunglasses. In the fall of 2016, a new breed of botnet made its appearance, the Mariah botnet. This malware infiltrated devices like wireless routers, digital video recorders, and security cameras, uniting them together so they could carry out extremely powerful DDoS attacks. Prior to this, the most substantial DDoS attacks had reached a few hundred gigabytes per second. With Mariah, the scale of the attacks had escalated to around one terabyte per second, posing a substantial threat. The author of Mariah, known as Anna Senpai, made the malware's source code public on hacker forums, inviting others to create their variants of Mariah. One notable Mariah attack targeted the security blogger Brian Krebs, delivering over 600 gigabytes per second and immediately bringing down his website. Shortly after, the French server hosting company, OVH, encountered a 1.1 terabyte per second onslaught in October, 
another wave of attacks hit DYN, a domain name system service provider, causing widespread outages, including Amazon, Netflix, Spotify, PayPal, and Reddit for users across North America and Europe. Around the same time, Mariah inflicted an attack on Liberia's primary telecom provider, severely impacting the country's internet connectivity. Hutchins, known for his passion for tracking storms, began monitoring Myers' assault waves. Collaborating with the Crypto's Logic colleague, he located Mariah's code samples and developed programs that penetrated various Mariah botnets. They intercepted the botnet's commands and set up a Twitter feed to provide real-time updates on their attacks. In January 2017, the same Mariah botnet responsible for the Liberia attack commenced a series of cyber attacks on Lloyds, the UK's largest bank, in a clear extortion plan that disrupted the bank's website. Utilising his Mariah tracker, Hutchins was able to identify the server responsible for issuing commands to focus the botnet's firepower to Lloyds. It appeared that the server was facilitating a DDoS for hire service. On this server, Hutchins found contact information for the hacker administering it. He promptly contacted the hacker using the name Popopret on the Java instant messaging service and urged him to halt the attacks. Hutchins made it clear that he understood Popopret wasn't directly responsible for the Lloyd's attack and was merely selling access to the Mariah botnet. He conveyed the consequences of the attacks, including the inconvenience and distress caused to Lloyd's customers, some of whom were stranded in foreign countries without access to their funds. Hutchins also emphasised that banks were categorised as critical infrastructure in the UK, implying that the British intelligence services were likely to track down the botnet's administrator if the attacks persisted. Ultimately, the DDoS attacks on the bank ceased. Over a year later, Hutchins shared this story on his Twitter feed, hinting at his own concealed history and expressing his belief that most people, even those involved in crime, are far removed from the consequences of their actions. He emphasised the importance of reconnecting them with their consequences. On May 12th, 2017, around noon, while Hutchins enjoyed a rare week vacation. Henry Jones, an anesthesiologist at the Royal London Hospital, located 200 miles to the east of Hutchins, began to notice that something was wrong. Jones, whose real name is kept a secret, was in an administrative room at the hospital, surrounded by several PCs. He was trying to check his email before his next surgical shift, but he encountered difficulties logging in. It appeared that the email system was down. This wasn't an entirely unfamiliar issue for the hospital staff, given that their PCs were still running on Windows XP, an operating system that was nearly two decades old. Jones, along with his colleagues, shared a collective sigh as they had grown accustomed to computer problems within the National Health Service. He thought, another day at the Royal London. However, the situation took a more unusual turn when an IT administrator entered the room and informed the staff that a virus was spreading across the hospital's network. One of the PCs in the room had restarted, revealing a red screen with a padlock icon in the upper left. The message displayed, Oops, your files have been encrypted and demanded a $300 Bitcoin payment to unlock the machine. Jones had no time to dwell on the message, as he was promptly called back to the surgical theatre. In the operating room, he was forced to wake up a patient after an orthopaedic procedure. However, the operating room's desktop PC appeared to be unresponsive, which concerned the surgeons and nurses trying to record the surgery's outcome. Once Jones completed his task and left the operating room, he was informed by the surgical theatre manager that all of his scheduled cases for the day had been cancelled due to a cyber attack. The attack had not only affected the entire hospital's network, but also broader trust, which included five hospitals across East London. All of their computers were offline. 
Jones felt a mixture of shock and anger. He thought to himself, could this be a coordinated cyber attack on multiple NHS hospitals? With no patients to attend to, he spent hours assisting the IT staff in disconnecting computers at the Royal London. It wasn't until he checked the news on his iPhone that he fully comprehended the extent of the damage. The attack was not targeted, but an automated worm that would spread across the internet. Within hours, it had affected over 600 doctors, officers and clinics, leading to 20,000 cancelled appointments. The malware had also wiped machines in numerous hospitals. As a result, surgeries were being cancelled and ambulances were being redirected away from emergency rooms. Patients with life-threatening conditions were left waiting for crucial minutes or hours, potentially leading to tragic outcomes. Jones came to the grim realisation that lives may have been lost due to the cyber attack. The worm responsible for this chaos was named WannaCry. It would add a .wncry extension to the encrypted file names. It spread through machines and demanded a Bitcoin ransom. WannaCry used a potent piece of code called Eternal Blue, which had been stolen from the National Security Agency by a hacking group known as the Shadow Brokers, and later leaked onto the internet. This code allowed hackers to infiltrate and run malicious code on unpatched Windows computers, potentially numbering in the millions. With this highly sophisticated NSA tool now weaponized, a global ransomware outbreak was coming. To those witnessing WannaCry's rapid spread, it was like watching the moments before a car crash. Cybersecurity analysts were aware that the impact on people's lives would be unmatched. As WannaCry continued to spread globally, it affected various companies, including Deutsche Bahn in Germany, Spurbank in Russia, automakers Renault, Nissan and Honda, universities in China, police departments in India, the Spanish telecom firm Telefonica, FedEx and Boeing. In a matter of hours, it erased data from an estimated a quarter of a million computers, causing damages ranging from $4 billion to $8 billion. There were concerns that WannaCry might expand into the US healthcare system. Josh Corman, who worked in cybersecurity for the Atlantic Council, joined a call on May 12th with representatives from the US Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Health and Human Services, the pharmaceutical company Merck, and American hospital executives. The group, known as the Healthcare Cybersecurity Industry Task Force, had just finished analyzing the significant shortage of IT security personnel in American hospitals. Now, they fear that WannaCry was poised to impact the US healthcare system, and the consequences could be far more severe than those experienced by the NHS. Corman recalled thinking, if this happens in mass, how many people die? It seemed that their worst nightmare was unfolding. At around 2.30 on that Friday afternoon, Marcus Hutchins, having returned from his local fish and chip shop, sat down at his computer and was startled to discover that the internet was in a state of chaos. Hutchins took to Twitter to express his thoughts, remarking, I picked a hell of a week to take off. Within a few minutes, a fellow hacker, who went by the alias Caffeine, sent Hutchins a copy of WannaCry's code. Hutchins immediately started dissecting it while his lunch remained untouched before him. To begin, he established a simulated computer on a server located in his bedroom, complete with fake files for the ransomware to encrypt. He executed the program within the isolated testing environment, and he noticed something important. Before encrypting the decoy files, the malware made a request to a seemingly random web address, a string that read this. This behaviour was significant in Hutchins' eyes. Hutchins decided to try access the web address, and to his surprise, he discovered that the site doesn't exist. He promptly visited the domain register Namecheap, and at 3.08pm, he registered the web address for $10.69. 
His hope was that this action would enable him to seize control of part of WannaCry's compromised computers, or at least obtain a tool for monitoring the number and location of infected machines, a practice known as sinkholing. As soon as Hutchins configured the domain on servers hosted by Crypto's Logic, it began to receive thousands of connections from newly infected computers worldwide. Through the sinkhole domain, he was now able to obtain exclusive information about these infections. Simultaneously, he tweeted about his progress, causing researchers, journalists, and system administrators to reach out to him with inquiries about the global attack. The sinkhole domain gave Hutchins a unique vantage point for gathering data on those infections that no one else possessed. For the next four hours, Hutchins worked on responding to emails and constructed a map to monitor the increasing infections worldwide, a task similar to what he had done with other botnets in the past. Around 6.30pm, approximately three and a half hours after Hutchins had registered the domain, he received a tweet from his hacker friend, Caffeine, which included a post by another security researcher named Darren Huss. Huss's tweet contained a concise yet startling statement. Execution fails, now the domain has been sinkholed. In other words, since the appearance of Hutchinson's domain online, new WannaCry infections had continued to spread but not inflict any additional damage. It appeared that the worm had been neutralised. Huss's tweet included a snippet of WannaCry's code that he had reverse engineered. The code indicated, prior to encrypting any files, the malware checked if it could establish a connection to Hutch's web address. If the connection failed, the malware proceeded with corrupting the computer's data. However, if the connection to the address succeeded, the malware halted its destructive operation. To Hutchins' surprise, he had found the malware's command and control address. He had discovered its kill switch. The domain he had registered served as a mechanism to terminate WannaCry's worldwide mayhem. Upon realising the significance of his actions, Hutchins couldn't contain his excitement. He leaped from his chair and danced around his room. In a highly unusual move, he headed upstairs to share the news with his family. Janet Hutchins, his mother, had the day off from her job as a nurse at a local hospital. She had been in town visiting friends, only just returning home to prepare dinner. Her awareness of the crisis that had been unfolding across the NHS was limited. When her son approached her and shared that he seemed to have halted the world's most severe malware attack, her response was simple. Well done, sweetheart. She then returned to chopping onions. Hutchins and his colleagues at Crypto's Logic took a bit longer to comprehend the lingering threat posed by WannaCry. The domain registered by Hutchins was still under heavy requests from connections originating from WannaCry infected computers worldwide. As the effects of the disarmed worm carry on, in the following two days, this domain received nearly 1 million connections. Hutchins' boss, Salim Ninao, realised that if the web domain were to go offline, it would result in the reactivation of WannaCry, potentially compromising every vulnerable computer across the globe within 24 hours. The problem grew almost immediately, as Hutchins observed a new wave of requests mixed with the WannaCry traffic aimed at the sinkhole. It became evident that one of the Mariah botnets, which Hutchins and his colleagues had previously tracked, had initiated a DDoS attack against the domain. Ninao compared the situation to Atlas, the mythical figure carrying the world on his shoulders, with someone now kicking Atlas from behind. Over the following days, the DDoS attacks continued to intensify, endangering the stability of the sinkhole domain. Crypto's logic scrambled to filter and absorb the wave of incoming traffic, spreading the load across servers in Amazon data centers and the French hosting company OVH. Things got worse when law enforcement mistakenly believed that the sinkhole domain was connected to the cyber criminals responsible for WannaCry. As a result, they physically seized two of Crypto's servers from the OVH database center. 
Hutchins, in particular, struggled to maintain the kill switch during these evolving threats. At the same time, the media started to chip away at Hutchins' carefully guarded identity. Two days after WannaCry's outbreak, a local reporter arrived at the Hutchins residence. The reporter's daughter had attended school with Hutchins, and she identified him in a Facebook photo that labelled him as malware tech. More journalists joined the fray, camping in their parking lot, and they were receiving constant phone calls, to the point where his family stopped answering the phone. British papers began featuring stories about the accidental hero who had saved the world from his own bedroom. To evade the media, Hutchins had to leap over his backyard wall to dodge reporters staking out his front door. In an attempt to stop the media intensity, he agreed to grant one interview to the Associated Press. Hutchins feared the emergence of a new version of WannaCry. The hackers behind the worm could easily modify it to eliminate the kill switch and unleash a sequel. However, that never ended up happening. After several days, the National Security Centre of the UK reached out to Amazon on behalf of Crypto's Logic and successfully secured unlimited server capability in Amazon's data centre. Following that, DDoS mitigation company Cloudfare offered its servers to absorb any level of traffic directed at the kill switch domain, effectively ending the standoff. As the worst of the danger softened, Nee now became concerned about Hutchins' well-being and incentivized him to get some rest by tying a portion of his employment bonus to it. When Hutchins finally went to sleep, a week after the WannaCry outbreak, he was compensated $1,000 for each hour that he rested. While the sudden fame made Hutchins uncomfortable, it did come with its perks. He experienced a rapid surge of Twitter followers, adding 100,000 new ones practically overnight. Strangers would recognise him and extend their gratitude by buying him drinks at the local pub and thanking him for his role in saving the internet. Even a nearby restaurant offered him free pizza for an entire year. Most importantly, his parents now had a better understanding of his work and were profoundly proud of him. Yet, it was at DEF CON, the annual Las Vegas hacking conference attended by around 30,000 people, taking place nearly three months after the WannaCry incident, that Hutchins fully embraced his newfound rock star status within the cybersecurity community. In an effort to avoid the continuous selfie requests from admirers, he, along with a group of friends, rented a mansion. The mansion was surrounded by hundreds of palm trees and featured the city's largest private pool. They decided to give up on the conference itself, with its crowd of hackers queuing up for research talks. Instead, they took regular trips, visiting the city's marijuana dispensaries and the grand open bar events hosted by cybersecurity firms. Their days were filled with recreational activities. One day, they headed to a shooting range where Hutchins himself fired a grenade launcher at hundreds of high caliber rounds from an M134 rotary machine gun. On other occasions, they rented Lamborghinis and Corvettes. Zipping down Las Vegas Boulevard and through the nearby canyons. During a concert by one of Hutchins' favourite bands, the Chainsmokers, he even took off his clothes, jumping into a pool right in front of the stage, and someone managed to steal his wallet from the pants he left behind. Three years had passed since Hutchins' involvement with Kronos. He felt like a different person, and as his reputation soared, he began to let go of the lingering fear that his past cybercrimes might catch up with him. However, on the final morning of his time in Vegas, as Hutchins stepped barefoot onto the driveway of his rented mansion, he noticed a black SUV parked across the street. Almost immediately, Hutchins began to provide a partial confession to the FBI agents during his interrogation. Just minutes after the agents in the McCarran Airport interrogation room bought up Kronos, he admitted to creating certain components of the malware. However, he falsely claimed that he had ceased work on it before he turned 18. Part of him held onto the hope that the agents were assessing 
if he would be a good witness for their WannaCry investigation, or attempting to pressure him into releasing control of the WannaCry sinkhole domain. Nervously, he responded to their questions, without legal representation. However, his hopeful thinking was gone when the agents presented him with a transcript. It was the record of his conversation with Randy from three years earlier, where the 20-year-old Hutchins had offered his friend a copy of the banking malware he was still actively maintaining. Finally, Agent Lee Chartier, the red-headed agent who had initially handcuffed him, clarified the agent's purpose. To be completely honest with you, Marcus, this has absolutely nothing to do with WannaCry. The agents that presented an arrest warrant charged him with conspiracy to commit computer fraud and abuse. Hutchins was transported to a Las Vegas jail in a black FBI SUV that bore an uncanny resemblance to the one he had seen parked outside of his Airbnb that morning. He was granted a single phone call, which he used to contact his boss. He was handcuffed to a chair within a room filled with inmates, left to wait the remainder of the day and the entire night. Instead of experiencing sleep, most of those long hours were consumed by his descent into a never-ending mental abyss. He was thinking about his possible future. Months spent in pre-trial detention, following by years in prison, he found himself 5,000 miles from home, and during the loneliest night of his 23-year-old life. However, unknown to Hutchins, a sort of defense mechanism was already taking shape within the hacker community. Following the phone call from jail, Ninao alerted Andrew Mabbitt, one of Hutchins' hacker friends in Las Vegas, who promptly leaked the information to a vice reporter and raised the alarm on Twitter. Instantly, well-known accounts began to rally behind Hutchins, rallying behind the hacker hero who was detained. Some believe that the FBI had mistakenly arrested Hutchins for his wannacry work, potentially confusing him with the hackers behind the worm. As Australian Asher Wolf put it, it's not often I see the entire hacking community really get angry, but arresting malware tech blog for stopping an attack is unacceptable. While not everyone supported Hutchins, like ex-NSA hacker Dave Adel, speculating that Hutchins might have created WannaCry himself and only activated his kill switch after the worm spiraled out of control. By the following day, the representative for Hutchins in the UK Parliament, Peter Heaton Jones, issued a statement expressing his concern and shock, commending Hutchins' contributions in combating WannaCry, and highlighted the astonishment of those who knew him in Ilfracoon and the border cybersecurity community regarding the allegations against him. Mabbitt succeeded in finding a local attorney for Hutchins' bail hearing. After a day spent in a crowded holding cell, Hutchins' bail was set at $30,000. He was cut from accessing his bank accounts due to the confiscation of his computers and phones. This meant Hutchins was unable to cover the costs. However, Tor Eklund, a renowned attorney specialising in hacker defence, stepped in to establish a legal fund in Hutchins' name, aimed at helping secure his bond. Donations began pouring in. Unfortunately, a significant portion of the contributions came from stolen credit cards, creating a bad image for a defendant facing computer fraud charges. Eklund, in response, terminated the fund and returned all donations. Nevertheless, the hacker community's goodwill towards Hutchins was far from over. On the day of his arrest, Tara Wheeler and Deviant Olaf, well-known cybersecurity professionals, had returned to Seattle from Las Vegas. Within the span of just one Sunday evening, this recently married couple learned about the issues surrounding Hutchins' legal fund through Mabin. Although Wheeler and Olaf only briefly interacted with Hutchins on Twitter and had never met him in person, they were familiar with the Justice Department's track records pursuing young hackers, often leading to tragic outcomes. They perceived Hutchins as a young, foreign, nerdy person of colour held in federal detention, and they were concerned about his situation. Believing he was the closest thing the hacker community had to a global hero, they felt he needed help. Wheeler had received 
a substantial severance package from Symantec, where a division had been closed down. What was originally intended for a home down payment, the money was now going to be used to bail out Marcus Hutchins. Within 24 hours of their return from Las Vegas, Wheeler and Olaf were back on the flight to the city. They landed just 90 minutes before the courthouse 4pm bail payment deadline. If they didn't make it in time, Hutchins would be sent back to jail for another night. In a rush, they grabbed a ride to a bank and obtained a $30,000 check. Upon reaching the courthouse, a court official informed them that the check had to be notarized. With only 20 minutes left before the courthouse office closed, Wheeler, barefoot, in a black sweater and a pencil skirt, sprinted through the scorching Las Vegas summer to a notary. Drenched in sweat, she had the check notarized. She then flagged down a stranger's car and persuaded the driver to take her back to the courthouse. Wheeler rushed through the courthouse doors at 4.02pm, just before the clerk closed up for the day, and handed him the check that would secure Marcus Hutchins' release from prison. Following this, Hutchins was released on bail and placed in a crowded halfway house. Meanwhile, the hacker community continued to mobilise his support. Respected lawyers Brian Clinton and hacker defence attorney Marcia Hoffman took on his case. During his trial, he pleaded not guilty, and a judge ruled that he could be placed under house arrest in Los Angeles. Over the next two months, his lawyers gradually erased his pre-trial conditions. These modifications allowed him to use computers and access the internet. However, he was still prohibited from accessing the WannaCry sinkhole domain he had created. Eventually, even his curfew and his GPS monitor ankle bracelet were removed. Hutchins received the news that the last pretrial restrictions were lifted while attending a bonfire party on the beach with friendly hackers from the LA Cybersecurity Conference, Shellcon. Remarkably, getting indicted for years old cybercrimes on a two week trip to the US had brought him to the city he had always dreamed of living in. With relatively few restrictions on his freedom, Crypto's logic had placed him on unpaid leave. So he spent his day surfing and cycling along the extended coastal path from his apartment to Malibu. Yet despite his newfound freedom, Hutchins was plagued with deep depression. He had no source of income, his savings were dwindling, and he faced serious charges that could result in years of prison time. Also, he was haunted by a painful truth. Despite all the accolades of his heroic acts, he knew that he indeed committed the acts he was accused of. Overwhelming guilt consumed him the moment he regained internet access and checked his Twitter mentions a month after his arrest. All of those people are writing to the FBI to say, you've got the wrong guy. And it was heartbreaking. The guilt from this was a thousand times the guilt I had felt for Kronos. Many supporters had interpreted his not guilty plea as a statement of his innocence, rather than a legal strategy, and they contributed tens of thousands of dollars to a legal fund. Former NSA hacker Jake Williams agreed to serve as an expert witness on Hutch's behalf. Tara Wheeler and Deviant Olaf became a source of support, accompanying him to his Milwaukee trial and helping him establish his life in Los Angeles. However, he believed he didn't deserve any of the assistance. He was convinced that everyone came to his aid, under the belief of his innocence. In reality, much of the support for Hutchins was more complex. A month after his arrest, cybersecurity blogger Brian Krebs conducted an investigation into Hutchins' past and uncovered clues that led to his old posts on hacker forums. These findings revealed that he had run an illegal hosting service, maintained a botnet, and authorized malware, though not necessarily Kronos. Despite the emerging truth, many of Hutchinson's fans and friends seemed firm in their backing of him. As Tara Wheeler explains, we are all morally complex people. Most of us, anything good we ever do comes either because we did bad before or because other people did good to get us out of it. 
or both. However, Hutchins continued to grapple with imposter syndrome. He turned to alcohol and drugs, using high doses of Adderall during the day and consuming vodka at night to numb his emotions. At times, he wrestled with feelings of despair, even contemplating suicide. He described the guilt as something that was eating him alive. In the spring of 2018, almost nine months following his arrest, prosecutors resented Hutchins with an offer. If he agreed to reveal all the information he possessed about the identities of other criminal hackers and malware authors he had encountered in the cyber world, they would recommend a sentence with no prison time. Hutchins contemplated the proposal. He insisted that he had no knowledge about Vinny, the real target for the prosecutors. More significantly, he held a principal stance against snitching on fellow hackers for minor offences to escape the consequences of his own actions. Furthermore, accepting the deal would still result in a felony record that could prevent him from ever returning to the United States. He was also aware of the unpredictability of the case's judge, Joseph Stadmuller, who sometimes issued sentences that deviated significantly from prosecutors' recommendations. Therefore, Hutchins declined the offer and opted for a trial. Prosecutors responded with a different indictment, bringing the total charges against Hutchins to 10, including the accusation of making false statements to the FBI during his interrogations. Hutchins and his legal team regarded their response as an intimidation tactic, punishing him for rejecting the earlier deal. After losing a series of motions, including one to dismiss his Las Vegas airport confession as evidence, Hutchins finally accepted a plea bargain in April 2019. This new agreement was arguably riskier than the one previously offered. After nearly a year and a half of negotiations with prosecutors, they now only agreed to make no sentencing recommendations. Hutchins would plead guilty to two of the 10 charges facing a maximum of 10 years in prison and a half a million dollar fine, entirely subject to the judge's discretion. Alongside his plea, Hutchins issued a public confession on his website. Though not the full confession he had hoped for, instead, it was a brief, lawyer-approved statement. I pleaded guilty to two charges relating to writing malware in the years prior to my career in security, he wrote. I regret these actions and accept full responsibility for my mistakes. Following this statement, he posted a more heartfelt tweet to clarify his misconception regarding his post. This misconception implied that a security expert must have engaged in illicit activities, suggesting that a hacker's unethical actions were a condition of their later moral contributions. Hutchins debunked this notion, asserting there is a misconception that to be a cybersecurity expert, you must dabble in the dark side. That's not true. You can learn everything you need to know legally. Stick to the good side. On a warm day in July, Hutchins arrived at a Milwaukee courthouse, dressed in a gray suit. He arrived two hours early to avoid the press. While waiting with his legal team in a briefing room, he felt a sense of impending doom, a familiar sensation that had lingered in his mind since his amphetamine withdrawal five years earlier. This time, his anxiety was not unwarranted. The rest of his life hung in the balance. To calm his nerves before the hearing, he took a small dose of Xanax and walked the halls. When Judge Stan Mueller entered the court and took his seat, the 77-year-old appeared somewhat unsteady and his voice quivered. Hutchins saw Stan Mueller as a wild card, given that the court had only been in charge over one prior cybercrime sentence 20 years earlier. He wondered how Stan Mueller would navigate this complex case. However, Hutchins released a sigh of relief as Stan Mueller embarked on a lengthy monologue. Instead, he was filled with awe. Stan Mueller started by recounting his three decade tenure as a judge and having sentenced 2,200 individuals. Nevertheless, he regarded Hutchins as a unique case. 
The judge acknowledged the dishonourable conduct underlying the case and compared it against Hutchins being a hero. He observed the exceptional nature of this case, recognising Hutchins as not merely a convicted criminal, but as a cybersecurity expert who had reformed long before facing justice. Stan Mueller contemplated the impact of imprisoning Hutchins, weighing his criminal actions against the good he has done. He emphasised the importance of safeguarding the technologies people rely on daily. And it was individuals like Hutchins who possessed the skill set to create solutions. The judge even suggested that Hutchins might warrant a full pardon, though he acknowledged that it was beyond the court's authority. Finally, Stan Mueller delivered his verdict. There are just too many positives that outweigh the negatives. He pronounced a sentence of time served with a one-year period of supervised release. Hutchins could hardly believe what he just heard. The judge had taken into account both his good and bad actions and concluded that his moral debt had been settled. Hutchins embraced his lawyers and his mother, who had travelled for the hearing. He exited the courtroom, paid a $200 admission fee, stepped out onto the street, nearly two years since his initial arrest. He was a free man. I would like to give a big shout out to the man himself, Marcus Hutchins. He is well known within the cyber community and has his own YouTube channel. A link to his channel will be in the description. And thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, be sure to subscribe and watch another video if you're interested.